I'm Nikia Louie, and I'm joined by dramaturg writer Donna Ravella, Anissa Violet, writer actor, two of the writers, including myself, as part of Playwriting Australia's Dear Australia project, a project which brings 50 playwrights from across Australia to write a postcard to Australia, thinking about the questions of who we are now, what is at the heart of us, what are we paying attention to, and where are we going in the future? I am so excited to talk to you today. So are we? It's great to be here. <laughs> Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. But I would also like to acknowledge uh, the elders and people who went before us who told stories. Yeah. I have a firm belief in that a community can never know its future if it doesn't know its history. Yes. So in saying that, this is a Dear Australia project, but I'd like to acknowledge that, a, that, that this is a, a continent that is now called Australia, but it is land where sovereignty was never ceded. I am a proud Gomorrah and Torres Strait Islander woman, and I grew up on Darek land in Western Sydney. I would love to ask what country you grew up on. Um, I grew up on um, Darug in Western Sydney, but I currently live um, in a local government area that acknowledges the Wangal and the Gadigal. Wonderful. I grew up on the land of the Darug Nation. I, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're a really big tribe. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. We don't know you all got Darug in common. <laughs> yeah. Now, just to give people a little bit of an idea of where we are right now, we're in the Joan Sutherland Centre in front of hundreds of empty seats. And I have to say that as a playwright, this is one of my worst nightmares. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. I've, I think we were chatting about it a bit before, but I genuinely feel at home here. Like, I'm just like, ah, I feel safe on stage. Yeah, I feel like, safe and I feel, uh, this yeah. is, for me, this is potential. Like, th mm. this is kind of like, you know, just, you know, before it all begins. Yeah. That anticipation and that beautiful moment, you know, before the house lights come down and the magic starts. Like, this is just prior to the magic starting, so I'm delighted to be here. Mm. Oh, I just <laughs> kind of want to jump to the end now and go, when do you think the magic will start again? <laughs> <laughs> They're saying it's at least a year, I think. I mean, because, you know, when's it going to be viable? You know, because you, you have to sit four seats apart. I mean, it's just not going to be viable for a very long time. I'm hoping, though, and this is a hope, that we can somehow shift the mode of performing so that perhaps we can't perform in theatres this big but we can somehow find a way to still perform and slowly reintegrate into these spaces post and during COVID. So I don't know. I'm hoping sooner. I'm just like a year's too scary mm. for me to even think about but I don't know. That's really, I really want to go back to that because I've been thinking about that a lot. Like, mm -hmm. is there something about the accessibility of being able to see something like theatre that is so site specific yeah. in a, in I guess a you want to say a COVID world, a post-COVID world, but it's 2020, it's, it's, mm. it's a lot of things now. It's been a big year, I think we can all, all agree. Yeah. Now, the Playwriting Australia Project, Dear Australia, has asked, as I said, 50 playwrights from across Australia, nominated from 25 feeder organisations, to write a short postcard to Australia for two to three minute clips. Now, this was in response to things like COVID-19, the sudden lockdown laws, which has affected, mm -hmm. I think, all of us greatly here, and we can talk about that. But what I would love to do is to start with a clip by Willow Wayland uh, called Hello Australia, which gives us a little insight into why we're here. <laughs> hey, 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 how's everyone doing tonight? Wanna know what you look like to a virus? Rows of scared little flesh puffs. Teeny weeny white marshmallows waiting to be melted. Yum. Tough crowd. So, a virus walks into a bar and the bartender says, why are you doing this? Why, why, why? And the virus says, well, there's lots of petty reasons. Clutch purses, dog prams, Active wear, business class. I mean, a species that literally makes inequality visible in a tiny space where you could all die together, jerks. The snooze button, stop pressing it. Touchless bathrooms, they don't work. All this hand washing and half you waving your hands under the tap like maniacs. 
vibrating ab belts, please. The like button, you're pathetic. Tween marketing. We make our own hell, don't we? And what about the time you blamed a generation of gay men for a virus? How you ostracised them as untouchable? While you ran ads about how it was the Grim Reaper? Have you considered that you may deserve this? What's weird is, it's not my killing that seems to bother you, it's that I don't discriminate. Even though I do draw the line at children, you just can't seem to believe that you're not special enough to be spared. When the bartender asks why, I don't consider what a nice daddy is. I just say, yum. I leap in his mouth and devour his lungs one by one until he screams that he cannot breathe. There is nothing more awful than a hypocrite posing moral questions. Sure, I'm filling random people up with pus, but your law enforcement officers are standing on throats and when they hear the plea, I cannot breathe, they press down harder. Hey, you. Yeah. Yeah, you. You there in the front row, the sweet couple with the nice haircuts and the cashmere cardigans. I have a question for you. Who causes the most suffering? You or I? What a clip. Yeah. What a monologue. Yeah. <laughs> what a postcard. Yes. <laughs> now, did you think that is what a virus would look like? In a comic setting, yes. I think that's a perfect depiction of a virus for I me. I think the costume nailed it. Yeah, it's I think great. it was awesome. What I think is so interesting about that clip, or that, that postcard by Willow, is that, you know, we've had the, 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 the coronavirus we put that under a microscope. That's what it looks mm. like. But really, what it seems to have done, I don't know about you, mm. is it's put the microscope back on us all. Mm. Yes. And I think yeah. looking at a lot of the postcards that have been contributed to this project, there is a lot of right, like wide-ranging themes, mm. but things like sovereignty, mm. colonisation, family, being isolated, vulnerability, mm. hope, fear, mm. scared, death seem to be like these really common themes popping up. Mm -hmm. I would love to talk to you about your projects. Mm -hmm. Donna, can we start with you? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, that, that was wonderfully savage. I love that, that one that sort of puts us under the microscope as a species, that one. Yeah. Um, what, what I, my process was um, in isolation, um, you know how you have certain radar for certain stories and news items and things, and one of my radars is domestic violence. Um, and the rate went up, as was predicted, as happens in crises. Um, and so I wrote a piece um, about a woman who, you know, who's, you know, the storyline is probably her husband's lost his job or he's working from home and, you know, possibly drinking and anyway, taking it out on her. Um, but it's not a victim piece, it's what it's about is um, she's, um, she's got a child mm. and so she's protecting this child. So she's like a hawk. And um, I'm interested in this, because the, the, a lot of the players were looking at um, isolation as safety. We were told to isolate, to be safe, but for some pre people it was not safe mm. and it became less so. Um, but what she does in this piece, she locks herself in the bathroom with the child, but she takes control of the domain she has available, which is that little tiny bathroom. Um, and she's, you know, um, soothing her child by distracting the child with a live bird cam. I got very obsessed watching live bird cam um, all really? around the world. There's an albatross in New Zealand I keep an eye on. Um, <laughs> Did you discover live bird cam? Oh, I'm just a bird nut. And I sh I've got bird nut friends and we share links. It's just one of those things. Oh, okay, yeah. But, but, I, but for me, I wanted to highlight domestic violence because, you know, we don't address it. We never address it. Crisis after crisis, yep. the numbers go up. We don't do anything. Structurally, we just don't. Um, but I also wanted to highlight um, the the resilience that that you know people have to cultivate to get through this, um, particularly if you're the guardian of of a young one. And how was your writing process with that? How long? These are two to three minute monologues. Yeah. I find as a writer that shortness is sometimes an absolute huge struggle. But also being in isolation, I was really overwhelmed. I think in a way that I uh, I couldn't. Um, it, it took a lot for me to realise that that I wasn't 
I found it really hard to write. Yes, yeah. yes. How, how was it for you? Same for me with this one, because I, I mean, because I had like ten ideas I wanted to try, and I, you know, I, I didn't want to leave one out. You know, I felt duty bound to a number of them. <clears throat> um, but all, once I'd committed, it took me a long time. Mm. Like it did. I mean, shortness isn't, you know, isn't doesn't make it easy because you still have to have the full concept, the full story, the full backstory. Mm. And what do you want when, when someone watches this? Because I think the great thing about the Dear Australia project is that we're taking theatre, which is something that is so site-specific, that is so momentary, mm. and now it's being permanent, it's being recorded, and it's being put into people's living rooms, or they can watch it when they're on the train, or, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's all of a sudden outside of here. Mm. So I guess when writing it, did you have an f- idea of what you wanted an audience, what someone maybe laying in bed on their phone, maybe they're in a TV relationship, what they wanted to take away from it? Um, with my particular piece, it's, it's kind of an interruption. Like, I think these things, part of the offer is that it's an interruption into, you know, what for some people is just the monotony of, of, of isolation. Mm. Um, but also, too, it really is about, um, you know, if you live with violence, the strength and resilience that you have to have. And part of it, I think, is by having a play like that out there, it's saying, I hear you, I know you're there, you know, something has to be done. So part of it is just that. Yeah, I like that idea of the, of the writer saying, I know you're there, mm. even though you might not have, they can't visibly see your audience like now, well, if there <laughs> were people in the audience, um, this is still frightening me. <laughs> Let's just not look at it. Yeah, <laughs> I always have this fear that after an interval of a show, I'll come back and just see empty seats. So it's oh. this, but I think there's something wonderful about that generosity of, of writing and going back to the role of the writer, which I would love to talk about, to come back to me, go a little bit deeper into, into that. Um, Anissa, yes. <laughs> I love your postcard. Oh, Shall we you. just go to the clip? Yes, I'd love to. That All right. Great. Do you want to introduce it with your name and title in third person or I can formally introduce you? I think you'd do a better yeah, job than me. <laughs> Drum roll, please. <laughs> Thank you. Can we l- see a clip of Anissa Violet's homeschooling? Thank you, Nikia. Great job. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> Like, like, I get it, I get it. But what else did you want me to say? I was confused. I'm confused, miss, it's the truth. I wasn't trying to be a smart ass. I'm just, I'm confused. Look, miss, I tried. I tried talking to you one-on-one in lockdown, remember? I asked why there were no Zoom classes in ISO. Yeah, but in the class stream, they were all saying, I'm confused because they were too. I wasn't trying to egg anyone on. And when you were like, what are you confused about? You need to explain yourself, what a exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And I was like, no offense, but what? Bracket, lol, bracket. Because like, how was I supposed to answer that question? Miss, I'm not trying to talk back at you. I'm just, I said it because I can't get things if you don't explain them to me, okay? Like the smart Asian chicks, they're fine. They're in ISO with their parents on their back. But my house, it was Ramadan, so I couldn't concentrate because my mum's food processor kept going on and off and on and off so she can make a feast fit for kings for us to break our fast on, which is so stupid because it's not the point. And like my parents, they're getting old, but they keep going out. Dad almost died when he realised the Flemington markets were closed. And my brother thinks COVID is bullshit. It was all made up. Yeah, and like, how do you explain COVID to someone who has Down syndrome? I mean, he didn't care with the bushfires because the New Zealand fireworks were still on, which is so freaking messed up. Sorry, miss. He's 35. And like, he couldn't go out with his group, so he was at home. And he kept getting angry at us and wanting us to take him out. But the stuffed up thing is, is that he still had to go to work. His job, where he gets three bucks an hour to pack boxes. Why is he, someone who is high risk, someone who could die from COVID, why is he still going to work? Why doesn't he get JobKeeper? 
Why doesn't he matter? During Ramadan in Iftar, he put his doggy's robe over his head and he put his arms up like a ghost and he was like, Look at me, I'm invisible. I'm invisible. He is. So like, yeah, I'm confused, miss. I don't get it. I don't. Wow, that's really powerful. <laughs> One of the, Thank some you. of the questions Thank as you. part of the Dear Australia project uh, that, that really spoke to me and I feel really came out in that clip, it's that idea of what is happening right now and trying to, to make sense of that and what are we not paying attention to? Yes. What's kind of falling through the cracks of our communities and our countries? So I would love to hear about what inspired you to write that. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Um, well, uh, hmm. so when I was asked the question, who's falling through the cracks, I immediately thought of my brother. So I have a brother who lives with Down syndrome and for me, he has a different ability to other people. And during COVID, I witnessed his trauma, his pain, his... I mean, I think throughout his life, he feels like he's not seen and he's not heard. But during COVID, it was magnified. It was just like he, he didn't understand what was happening. But worse still, it was like the tiny things that he had, not tiny things, the, the parts of his life that gave him autonomy were taken away. He was no longer allowed to go to, out with groups. He was no longer allowed to go to the shops. Um, and... And I just, the, my first question was, okay, I, I actually contacted Playwriting Australia and I said, is there anybody from a different, different ability who, who, who's part of this project? Because I, I was just like, we need to hear from them right now. Yeah. And I felt a responsibility to offer a slice to our country of what someone living with Down syndrome, living with a different ability experienced during this time but also I was speaking to my nieces and they're, well, obviously I'm, I'm from Western Sydney. I've born and raised Western Sydney. Like I can put on the accent in a heartbeat. Um, and I sort of asked my nieces, I was like, how are you going with homeschooling? And they were struggling because not once did they get a, a classroom session where their teacher was speaking directly to them. And they spoke to me about how they just could not understand things if they did not have somebody speaking directly to them. So for me, this piece was born out of the need to be a spokesperson for Western Sydney, for young people from um, a different cultural background. Muslims during COVID as well, it was, it was quite tricky for us to operate, to have Ramadan in COVID, it was bizarre. Yeah. It was very spiritual, but strange. Um, and also, people with a different ability. I felt the need to speak on behalf of them. And I just have to mention Ala Sukaria, who's the actor in that clip. She has never trained at an institution before. She's one of many people living in Western Sydney who are bursting with talent. So it was really important for me to have her perform that piece because it's a political statement as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that was like a big rant. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Don't like, ever apologise. It was all no, great. No, yeah, yeah. No, I, I love, I love hearing that. I think there is something really. This, this is something about the mundane, like the, the mundanity of, yes. of, of, of also isolation and lockdown mm -hmm. while dealing with these big issues. Yes, but still having to just go by your doing your day to day things. Yes, I found that a real struggle yes. in a way. Um, how is well, I would, if, if you don't mind me asking, mm. how is, like, who have, you, how, who have you been locked down with? Locked down with, and how is, how did the, I guess, the lockdown restrictions, especially in the arts, affect your career or even just um, how you view yourself as a writer? It's a fairly intimate question, but I would love to, yeah. Well, I, I don't, um, for me, lockdown helped me truly understand what I want to fight for. And, okay, I'm going to admit something. I had an enormous breakdown during lockdown. Um, I called an arts organisation in Australia in relation to a grant and the person on the phone said to me, 
you need to apply for this grant with the thought in mind that theatre may never come back. And I could not stop crying. I just couldn't stop. And then I realised it was because there was so much I felt like I wanted to do that I hadn't done. So if theatre was gone, I hadn't done enough. And so what it's done is, I mean, I was in lockdown with my mother, my father, they're both they're quite, um, they're of an older age, so they're high risk. My brother Adele and another brother. And for me, theatre had always been my home, my second home. And I had also, I was also an artist that constantly went overseas to Europe in order to feel free in how she communicated. And I know that that's another big can of worms that we could <laughs> open up. But um, what it did was it made me really ask myself, what am I not doing? What do I need to do? Who do I need to represent? What do I need to stop doing? Um, yeah, so mm. it was for me. Um, when, um, when it hit, I had um, two shows um, about to go into rehearsal. They were both going into rehearsal on the 6th of April, one at the Griffin as part of the Batch Festival um, and uh, one at the at, um, Darlinghurst Theatre Company. And so within two days, I lost two shows and you know, the juggernaut that a show is, you know, um, and it just, it was like I was literally slammed into a wall and I lost my job in that same week. Um, and so I slept for the next two weeks. I just, I, I was sleeping 14 hours a day and I couldn't make, I'd open the fridge and I couldn't make a decision. You know, I, I just couldn't, I was just, you know. And then I kind of had a dream and in the dream I worked out that, you know, I was dissociated. Mm. I had had a shock reaction. Now I live alone um, and I love living alone. Like I live in an apartment block, so I know everyone in my block and I've got lots of friends who left stuff on my doorstep and like, gorgeous angels who just, you know, made it very known that I was loved and looked after. Um, but I still had to process everything alone. Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. the shock, the, 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 the trauma, like, you know, what, and we talked before we opened this conversation about this um, COVID isolation lockdown process. It, there's waves of reactions. Yeah. You know, there's not one reaction you're having. You have reaction upon reaction and you need time to process all of them. And so, I've turned uh, this time into a sabbatical. It took a long time to get that happening because I couldn't think, you know, I couldn't be productive. And a, a lot of artists were giving each other permission to not make, just be, just react. Yep. So, yeah, but I, I, I'm kind of on my feet now, but it took a while. How about you? Yeah. yeah, I find that really interesting, that permission to not do it, like to, to, to be able to not produce. Yes. Um, I found it incredibly difficult to write. I found sitting down to write my postcard quite, quite hard. Mm. Um, emotionally, the circumstances yes. of everything going on in the world. Um, and, and then also just, I think, talking about that disassociation, like that, that trying to oh, no, I can't write. And I have to be honest, I got filled a little bit with panic yep. because I define my identity as yep. so much, it's, it's being a writer is so yes. much of that. Then all of a sudden it was not only do I not know if the industry I work in will ever go back to being the same. Yes. But, um, and not that it necessarily should go back to being mm. the same either because it's not an industry without flaws, which mm. I think is one of the great things yep. about Dear Australia is that there's so many different writers mm -hmm. out there, all of these different, speaking to what you were saying, Anissa, a performer who isn't tra tra uh, pr uh, what is it? Traditionally, traditionally trained? Is it yeah. traditional? It yeah. feels like a weird word trained. to use, but yeah. you know, you didn't go to acting school, I guess. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Fancy school. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but you know, like being able to <laughs> encapsulate a lot of talent that maybe we yeah. wouldn't see or hearing from people we wouldn't always hear because of the limitations of, mm. of live performance programming. Yes. So I think that's what's quite brilliant mm. about this. So saying that it may not go back to being the same, maybe it mm. shouldn't, and maybe we should be changing it, um, which I think is what we're doing. Yes. But um, also uh, that I just might not be able to write again. Mm. Uh, I, I, yeah, okay. there was so much going on in the world. Does mm. that make It sense? does, because yeah. you're also processing, like I remember when I was sort of, you know, dealing naming dissociation and then I wrote my I wrote a blog post and I wrote myself back into awareness and so writing did do that for me yeah um but you know I was doing that while I was looking at you know parks you know uh, you know off you know New York being used to bury extraordinary numbers of people mm. like it, it was just kind of like what has just yeah 
happened, not to me, but to the world, you know, it was just huge, too huge. And, you know, you're trapped inside four walls. <laughs> totally, totally. I wonder um, what I would like to ask, we were speaking, what, what you got me thinking about, Donna, that idea. So when I wrote my piece, yes. when I wrote it, it felt like a relief in a way because it was like, finally, I've gotten something on a page. Mm -hmm. I hadn't written down anything on a page for weeks. So it was it was galvanising in a way. Mm -hmm. It kind of hopefully, I think I, they were only short and I got to the end and I started crying on my couch. Um, with, with where your career is going now, have you had to reassess what it is to be a writer? and what your identity is as a writer, either of you? I, I've been thinking, well, I mean, you know, because theatres may not open for, you know, a year or two in the way that we know them, um, I've not really um, worked across platforms and so, but I, but I mentor a lot of people who work, work, work across yes, different platforms, mm. um, but I haven't myself done that. So you know, I'm thinking more seriously about, you know, how can I do that? Um, yeah. I don't know, I'm still thinking, like, how do I survive this? And, and the day job that I have, like, that might not, you know, we might lose those jobs. Yeah. And so I, I, I'm actually just bewildered. I, I don't have an answer because I'm, I'm still bewildered. I don't know where I can put my skills. You're right in the midst of it. Yeah. You're still figuring it out. Anissa, what about yourself? Has, it, has this, you spoke, yeah, the, 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 the tears of the, there might be... There might not be an industry mm. to come back to. Has that changed how you think of yourself as a writer or what a writer is to you? Um, yes, it kind of made me... Uh, it, it made me start to be, lean more into being an entrepreneur, to be honest. Yeah. I, was, um, I was just like, OK, what, what's something that I can create? How can I...? Because for me, we will always need stories. Um, stories keep us alive and I refuse to give up on being a storyteller. It helped me realise that I'm a storyteller. I actually had a dark night of the soul. This all sounds so dramatic. <laughs> but it's true, like it, it was on Eid. I had too much coffee. I went to bed and I was really like, OK, I'm going to go to sleep. And I woke up at 3am and I was like, oh, I'm a storyteller, whatever that means. I mean, that's what I need to do. And I've actually, something that I would love to do is I'd love to run a project where I lean back into Arabic traditional forms of storytelling, hakawati, where a storyteller stands in front of members of their communities, just a small, it can be a small crowd or it can be a big crowd. And I really want to become a hakawatiya where I tell stories, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in a theatre like this, it doesn't need to be for people that can afford a $90 ticket because my family can't. Mm. Mm. I would really like to bring it back out into the community. So it, it helped me understand why I do what I do, but also how I need to shift to suit this climate because I do not want to give up mm. on what we offer. Like you can see it in the Dear Australia Project, your writing, mm. you know, I would never want to live in a world where I don't get to experience your writing or mm. the writing that we've experienced mm. through Dear Australia Project. But what about you, Nikki? <laughs> like, I'd love to hear. Like, yeah, it... well, um, maybe I should, I feel really weird doing this, but yeah. um, maybe we should go to my clip. Yes, um, <laughs> I, I, mean, I realise I've just been yeah. <laughs> interrogating you. Um, um, well, I'll present. I feel like I should do the drum roll thing yes. as a traditional thing now. Um, I I called it the. What, what did I call it? I forget now. When I, the bleeding know, stopped. When the night the bleeding the night, stopped. Yes. The night the bleeding <laughs> stopped by Nikia Louie. Here Yay. it is. <laughs> the day the world started ending, I miscarried. We were told not to leave our houses. As my husband locked the doors, I sat on the floor of my shower, the gushing waters drenching me as I cried in pain and my tears and blood flooded the bathroom drain. There goes the future, I thought. I didn't know whether to be sad or relieved. Did I want to be pregnant during an apocalypse? I wondered if it was my fault because I didn't know whether I wanted to bring a baby into the world in the first place, even before it started ending. In the end, it didn't matter what I thought because as I bled and bled and bled, what replaced my baby was a heavy black pit. 
like a black hole that seemed to be sucking me inwards. As life left my body, I cramped over and held my middle. Feeling so much despair, I thought I would just implode and disappear. The hardest part was telling my parents I miscarried on a Zoom. I couldn't see them in person because of the chronic health problems caused by colonisation. A slow genocide as each generation dies younger and younger. This time so young that their grandchild just bled right out of me. I spoke to my doctor over the phone. A very convenient way to get all the numbing drugs I needed. My husband and I played heads and tails and created a suicide plan as to who would kill the other first, just in case. But nothing changed. I kept on bleeding. I kept on eating. And then I stopped dreaming. Who knew the end of the world would have Uber Eats and endless Netflix? That little black pit continued to throb in me and I started forgetting the past. Memories became deja vu. No memories made death easier. But just as I thought the world would end, not with a bang, but with a whimper, a black man is killed on a street in another country, but a country with the same story as mine. Images of black bodies being brutalised started flooding TV screens. Images I'd seen all my life. Images I'd gotten used to. Then I had a dream. A little brown girl came to me and told me she was my daughter. We sat in my late grandmother's house and my daughter held my hand and she spoke to me. She told me, dear Australia, this. There was no Australia. No world to lose. No utopia to save. She told me my ancestors loved me and so did she. Then I woke up. That night, the bleeding stopped. And suddenly the little dark pit in me became white hot anger. A raging question mark. From the destruction, could there be something new? Something better? That's when I realized that my whole life has always just been creating life out of darkness. Creating a life in a world that didn't want you. That was my inheritance as a First Nations woman. That is when my anger came back and the world stopped ending because the world has ended again and again and again. And I was loved, I am loved and will still love. As the world burned, I finally started to have hope again. Mm. Yes. That's beautiful. Yeah. I think part of that for me and why, um, like, it was very personal, um, but it made me think a lot prior to, you know, we, we, when, we, when we went into lockdown, mm. um, thinking about, yes, I'm a writer, but I'm also a First Nations person. Mm -hmm. And for me, that gave me a real sense of, when I made that realization, if this makes any sense, I started to finally be able to have hope mm. when I kind of saw, what was interesting is that you have this coronavirus, we're all in lockdown, but then you realize that actually the world is maybe a broken place. And the reason that, mm. So many people have been vulnerable and fallen through the cracks is because this isn't, I'm just repeating the monologue, no, no. there isn't a utopia. I started thinking a lot about my mother and my grandmother and my great-grandmother and my great-great-grandmother um, and the struggles that they've had to face 
finding colonisation in Australia. You know, little things like my mum grew up in a tent hiding from the Aborigines Protection Board. Mm. You know, um, they, uh, um, you know, genocides, um, you know, even just things like chronic health problems. Mm. And, you know, I've in locked as I've, I've had a lot of family members die during this time period as well but I guess what I'm saying is I was thinking about those women and I thought well they've always created life out of nothing mm, yeah. right and it's really easy to kind of go oh it's it's easy to give up and it made me kind of think about what a writer is mm. and I always think maybe a writer is just speaking speaking truth to the world as you see it mm-hmm. And that does have a crossover with activism. Mm -hmm. And maybe at this time when things are at our lowest is when we actually think we can break it and make it better. Mm. Yes. Um, And that was a bit of a ramble and probably not making lots of sense. But I've been Mm. thinking a lot about that. And and there's quite a a number of amazing First Nation writers that Mm -hmm. are participating in in this project. And this idea of the past and and colonisation. But so many, what was surprising, um, and Anissa, you brought this up prior before what was so amazing is first nations people with this like we're constantly fighting to be recognized in this country just to be seen and have our past uh acknowledged um what was interesting is that so many of the works from first nations people i found um or or works where you know racism came up a lot um is that it's actually speaking to the future and changing it, yes. which I found really hopeful. And I think as as a writer, I think, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. If you can hear it, you can say it. Yes. And that's what our stories are. Yeah. And we have to fight really, really hard to, to not have them taken away from yeah. us. Yes. One of the things that really stood out for me with the First Nations works was this idea that this is not new. We, we, we yeah. know contagion. We know smallpox, we know social distancing because people don't sit with us on buses. You know, we know isolation because of the mission experience. Um, And so the reframing by First Nations writers of this crisis in terms of, you know, for them, we we talk about, you know, in this unprecedented time, but for for First Nations people, this unprecedented time is 240 years old. Um, And so part of the future is actually seeing that you know, making all of us aware of that. I really like that. And as in speaking to the future, how do you speak to the future as a writer in your practice? Um, I, I mean, I, I, your, your character and what you were saying, I mean, you know, you, you're standing on the, the shoulders because you, your character goes forward when there's the connection made with ancestor. Yes. Um, and so, you, you know, for, for me, um, it's this idea of legacy. Like, you know, I will never finish what I set out to do. Mm-hmm. Like all the changes I want to make, you know, with diversity and all yeah. of that, they will, you know, all the gains that I've fought very hard for, for gender equity and parity and all of that. You know, there's a lot that's not going to finish by the time I go. Mm-hmm. But, you know, you just you just keep the flag flying. And, 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 and I think that part of what, you know, I want to come out of this experience is the idea of, you know, a new legacy. Because we're leaving... You know, our, our, the legacy's crap. I mean, you know, it's kind of like the first clip. You know, it's kind of like we're a dumb species. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 you know, yeah. and if, if this is nature saying, you know what, time's up, you know, it's kind of like, yeah, fair enough. You know, we're a dumb species. But, but you know, that's sort of the jokey end of it. But, it'll, but it is about legacy. Like, like for me, you know, the stories you tell, um, you have to be aware of what you're putting in people's heads. You have to be aware of the politics of the form you know, that, you know, that you're using. Um, you have to be aware of, you know, the characters you're privileging. Um, and I, I'm very careful when I choose all of those things because that's my legacy and that's the activism. So I choose to spotlight certain experiences and not others. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's very, and certain forms and not others. And so, you know, and I'm just one of many doing that. So, um, yeah. I think that's interesting what you're saying about activism because there's been so much talk about activism and what that is mm-hmm. when speaking to Black Lives Matter and mm-hmm. Aboriginal deaths in custody, especially from non-Aboriginal people. If mm-hmm. we, we look at Australia, this idea of com- like being, being complacent is being complicit and that we all have something to say and we're engaging with the politics of, of, of everything every day because politics are humanity because we live it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Speaking to that activism, what I find really interesting and what you're saying is, and it goes back to something you said earlier about putting a piece of work into to someone's, like wherever they're watching this. 
and letting them know they're not alone. Mm. Yeah. Because I think one of the biggest things that, like, we know, I think, I don't know about you, but, the, like, one of the things I'm ruminating at this moment, at this time, is that things do need to change. Yes. You know, when this project is one of them, us having this conversation is one of it. Yes. But change requires solidarity. Yes. yes. And solidarity is incredibly difficult to achieve yes. when people are locked in their homes. Mm. You know, we need dissent mm. to have that conversation. So I think that's something mm. really powerful about creating a work to have someone be seen mm. Mm-hmm. Mm. that's really accessible mm. mm-hmm. to have that solidarity, mm-hmm. to move forward and know that they're not alone. I really, yeah, just mm. that, you know, when you have a light bulb moment, I was mm. like, yeah, that, that is, that's really mm. special. Mm. What about yourself, Anissa? Uh, um, oh, gosh. Uh, for me, this process and what I what I, okay so what I would really love to come out of this time is is a new normal where we see that number of First Nations writers on stage and screen as as the baseline normal like we for me that that was one of the most exciting things about the Dear Australia project is, was to see that many First Nations writers on like their, their, their work presented um, and same for people of colour and hopefully more people with different abilities writing for that project but also um, I personally what this period has done to, for me is it's helped me realise where I need to do the work so I consider myself as white passing and I obviously have certain minority identities that have disadvantaged me but I also feel like there's certain privileges that I've grown up with and I want to do the work and I want to keep working towards a better world so for me your monologue really resonated with where I'm at right now even just as a a metaphor for where I want the world to be for um for past generation um next generations but also I want to lean into becoming a better ancestor as well so yeah that's how I've changed sounds really meta but I think it's just what we are, we're sensitive, we're, we're listening as much as we can as artists, so it's maybe what's happening, yeah. speaking to us. And also, just really quickly, yep. um, listening to pain, because what's really you know, interesting about so many of them, um, because this is a pause, you know, in a lot of the plays, people are hearing the pain that you know, our elected representatives do not acknowledge. And I think that that's something that we can hold up and say, it's there, it's there, do something. Yep. I think that's really, I, I really I like that. And I, I, sp- I really like what you just said, Donna. And Anissa, that creating a baseline normal. Yes. And I'd love to, I'd love to ask you what you would think about, how, like what, when the theatre industry comes back, what are changes that you would like to see made? Like what does theatre post COVID in the future, when let's say these, or, like, these chairs are all filled, what does, what does that theatre look like? I'd like the seats to be $10 each. <laughs> <laughs> like, really, like, equity. No, I mean, true. you know, e- like, equity, like, you know, why not? Yes. I want yeah. better represi- representation for um, uh, black and brown artists in, within the theatre industry, like, behind the scenes and in key positions. I think that that completely needs to change. I think we need to deal with our systematic racism on all levels, we need to acknowledge it. I want companies to, the Royal Court recently um, put out a, um, a, a pledge to deal with their systematic racism. And I want every single company in Australia to do that. I don't think it's acceptable anymore that we turn a blind eye or we play the game of ignorance anymore. We need to deal with our feelings, our fears. Let's air it out, let's create a better industry, but also let's create a stronger connection with our communities because I know so many people, when they see great theatre, they're like, this was amazing. But then they see something else and they're like, that's not me on stage. Why would I even bother to come and see it again? Let's stop pretending that we're performing to a certain audience. Let's actually create an industry that thrives and that the country is in constant relationship with. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Just make, yeah. And what about you? You know what? I think I would like to, I've been trying to ask myself, how do you, like accessibility is a huge yes. thing for me. And this is what I think is exciting about this. Um, I did a Q&A with Maine Wyatt a couple of weeks ago, yes, yes. talking about Indigenous deaths in custody. And he performed a monologue mm-hmm. from his play City of Gold. Yep. Um, and 
it was thrilling sitting there watching it because it's such an amazing uh, piece. And, you know, people in the paper were saying it was like the best two minutes Two, two minutes of television that they've ever seen or in Australian history. But what really excited me about it, and this is a little bit of a being a theatre nerd, is that it took theatre into people's homes mm. and it showed people the power of what theatre can be. Yes. And I think that that also, you know, because Maine wrote that, also just kind of how important writers are in the legacy of, of who we are and who we are becoming. Yes. So I think I would like to see, um, you know, I love the fact that I can sit in my living room and watch this. I can sit in my living room and watch things in the UK. Mm. I can, you know, you can have someone like Maine Wyatt do a monologue mm. on television that changes the way that people view Black Lives Matter and Indigenous rage, yes. which for me is something personally I've always struggled with because mm. people think you're always the angry Aboriginal writer. Then to have, people be like, you have a right to be angry, to see your anger celebrate it when it's being written and performed by someone, you're not alone. And then that recognition, for me, that was really galvanising and it has really kind of given me forthright as a person into how I want to go into the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that cheap tickets, I'd barter for tickets. Um, <laughs> but you know what? What's really been fascinating to me is um, how younger people have responded mm -hmm. to things and, you know, the world around them. Um, you see their activism playing out on Twitter, um, protesting in the streets, but also seeing younger people having these conversations about bias that, you know, pe people my parents' age are struggling with, mm -hmm. you know, in, in very open and honest ways. So I think in saying that, I would love to see a clip written by Brendan Hogan, and it's his postcard called Spiderweb. Mm -hmm. The playground's closed. The council put up a sign saying no one's allowed to play. But it's the only one, so I'm still gone. I mean, what are they gonna do, find a 12-year-old? You get the swing to yourself, and the slide, and best of all, Caleb Green is nowhere to be seen. Remember when we used to play King of the Castle? And he'd sit on top of the spider web and wouldn't let anyone else get up. We were all just scrambling up the ropes. And he was yelling and kicking and spitting until we just fell through the web or gave up. I gave up, but you didn't. You just kept going back up and up. And then when you were almost to the top and everyone could see Caleb was gonna lose, he changed the game. He always changes the game when he's about to lose. And everyone just lets him. You see, I just sat up there, alone. I just watched the street and watched and thought about all the little people stuck in their houses. And I thought about you and the thing that happened before lockdown. I made this card for you. Charlie, I'm really sorry for not letting you play Gang Tiggy with us because you're Asian and Caleb said we'd catch the coronavirus if you touched us. I don't know why I put my hand up when we took the vote, but I think I was because I was scared of Caleb. Sorry. I know it's not true about you having coronavirus and I'm really sorry. P.S. You don't have to forgive me if you don't want to. So, yeah. I'll just... Oh, and don't worry, I used hand sanitizer and spray the card with Glen 20, so, yeah. And, um, if you wanna, I'll be at the playground this afternoon on top of the spider web, if you wanna. I mean, what are they gonna do, find two 12-year-olds? I thought it was, I just loved that. Yes. Like so, a kid so great. engaging with, yeah. with something that a country is having such difficulty doing, or the world yes. is having difficulty doing. Yeah. So we started off, this is Dear Australia, 
50 playwrights writing a two to three minute monologue to Australia. If Australia wrote you a postcard, what would you like Australia to say to you? You belong. Oh, was it just a line? Oh, no, that's, that's, sorry, that just came beautiful. to me. I was like, yeah. sorry, it's just you belong. I would like the postcard to say, we will take care of the recovery and we will reset our systems. That's a bit, yeah. <laughs> so that they're inclusive. Yeah. <laughs> I think I would like mine to say, dear Nakia, I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, great. Cheers. Yep. XX. Yes, <laughs> great. <laughs> well, thank you so much for this chat. It's been really good for my soul as a writer, thank talking you. to other writers in a socially distance acceptable way. Yes. <laughs> um, but congratulations on your great work and thank you for the great chat. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, thank you, so you. Much. It's been good for my soul too, and I'm sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank great. you. Great. Thank you so much. You're writing. <laughs> Do we just